In the parable of the sheep and goats, Jesus described the final judgment for sheep-like ones and goat-like ones during the Great Tribulation. As Jehovah's appointed judge and king, Jesus will be completely righteous in the judgment that he gives. As a thorough judge, he is already observing the actions, attitudes, and speech of all people, including how they treat his anointed brothers. By the start of the Great Tribulation, Jesus will have identified those who are sheep-like or goat-like in their conduct and attitude. From that time onward, those who are goat-like will not seek to change. However, those who are sheep-like and who have the hope of living forever on earth will need to remain faithful in order for Jehovah to keep their names in the book of life. Then, just before Armageddon, God's Son will pass final judgment on all those then living here on earth. Persons who are judged to be righteous will enter into everlasting life on earth. What a marvelous reward for those who keep their integrity. And let's again skirt over what happens to the unrighteous at Armageddon, shall we? Just as Jeffrey Jackson did in the previous talk, where he was talking about the goats, he very quickly skirted over it and didn't admit to his audience that Armageddon will kill non-Jehovah's Witnesses. Kenneth Cook's pulling the same trick here, or he's dodging the same elephant in the room. He doesn't want to admit to how doomsday and judgmental this religion is so he's focusing just on the good bits, on the positives, on what's going to happen to those found righteous at Armageddon, namely Jehovah's Witnesses, rather than what's going to happen to everyone who's not a Jehovah's Witness, namely death and slaughter. This, by the way, is Kenneth Cook speaking in the talk titled, Are You Heeding the Warnings? This talk at the 2021 annual meeting is following on from Jeffrey Jackson's talk where he's just unveiled some rather convoluted new light about John 5 verses 28 and 29 that, in my view, isn't really that significant. And Kenneth Cook apparently can't resist jumping up on the platform immediately afterwards and reminding the audience that last year he was the one delivering new light. He was the one coming up with an adjusted understanding about the sheep and goats, which, as I've pointed out, thumbnail here if Tibor is gracious, isn't really new light, it's really more of a flip-flop. So the organisation went from thinking that the sheep and goats would be judged based on their behaviour, based on their actions in the last days, that was the teaching under Rutherford, they wound up thinking that the sheep and goats would be judged based on what would happen either during the Great Tribulation or after the Great Tribulation. And they've come full circle. They're now back where they started. And yes, the sheep and the goats are being judged based on what they're doing now, based on what people's record is in the here and now, in the build-up to Armageddon. You have to ask, how is this evidence of God's guidance? If God can guide his faithful slave to adopt one teaching and then to ditch that teaching and pretty much go back to where they were to begin with, it's not very efficient, is it? It doesn't speak to any real wisdom. It's exactly what you would expect of a man-made, human-led religion that's just making it up as they go along. Let's briefly consider how anointed Christians are chosen. We'll start by looking at a lesson from ancient times. When the priesthood was established in ancient Israel, Jehovah decided who would serve as high priest as well as the underpriests at the tabernacle. Uh, Exodus 28.1 tells us that he selected Aaron along with his sons. No one could rightly question Jehovah's choice, and those chosen had to prove worthy of their calling. 
similar to what he did back then. Jehovah chooses those who will serve as priests in heaven. He began by selecting Jesus to serve as high priest. Although Jesus was a perfect man, he did not choose that role for himself. We read at Hebrews 5 and verse 5 that the Christ did not glorify himself by becoming a high priest. Likewise, those who will serve as priests in heaven do not choose themselves for this assignment. They are selected by Jehovah and anointed with his Holy Spirit. He knows each one whom he has anointed for this service. How do faithful anointed ones view their heavenly calling? When a person is anointed by God, he or she knows without doubt that it is from Jehovah and that one accepts Jehovah's choice with gratitude. Instead of feeling proud or haughty, anointed ones strive to imitate Jesus' example of humility. They're helped to do so by keeping in mind the lessons and warnings that are found in Jesus' parables for them. Kenneth Cook here, who, let's remember, identifies as one of the anointed, has decided to tackle the question, how are anointed Christians chosen? Let's briefly consider how anointed Christians are chosen. And if you strip away all of the fluff and all of the beating around the bush, this ultimately is the answer to that question. Those who will serve as priests in heaven do not choose themselves for this assignment. They are selected by Jehovah and anointed with his Holy Spirit. So the answer to the question, how are anointed ones like Kenneth Cook chosen, is Jehovah chooses them. Great. That's, <laughs> that's pretty much what everyone expected you to say, Kenneth Cook, as someone who considers himself to be one of only 144,000 who have ever lived in the history of our planet who is worthy of ruling in heaven as a king priest with Jesus. Think about it. As I said earlier in this rebuttal, a hundred billion, it's estimated, have ever lived. A hundred billion. <laughs> And out of a hundred billion who have ever walked the earth, if we were to narrow it down to an elite, an elite of 144,000 who should rule over the planet forever, you're looking at one of them <laughs> in the form of Kenneth Cook. And we can trust Kenneth Cook because he's just told us that the decision wasn't made by him, <laughs> it was made by Jehovah. Well, that makes total sense. Case closed on that one, I think we can all agree. <laughs> There's no need to doubt God's judgment there. There's no need to, I don't know, ask for evidence or proof of this extraordinary claim that's being made that Kenneth Cook, this fine specimen, is among a tiny elite of everyone who has ever lived who is most suitable to rule in heaven with Jesus. This is the level of credulity that's needed when you're one of Jehovah's Witnesses. You just have to watch Kenneth Cook saying all this and think, yeah, I trust you, you know, <laughs> seems legit. Why wouldn't God choose you, Kenneth Cook, to be one of only 144,000 who've ever lived, who get to rule in heaven with Jesus. You seem like a really great guy. And actually, when I think about it, it the same could be said of Stephen Lett, <laughs> Tony Morris, Samuel Hurd, Jeffrey Jackson, David Splain. They're all amazing specimens of humanity. And, you know, the more I think about it... <laughs> the more I could totally imagine that out of a hundred billion people who've ever lived, these are the ones who would be chosen <laughs> as being the elite, as being the ones most suited to rule over the planet.
Well, thanks for clarifying that for us, Kenneth. Unfortunately, it doesn't make the whole thing any easier to believe. And more to the point, you haven't told us anything new. This is already the nonsense Jehovah's Witnesses are expected to swallow. 